Hello everyone and welcome to this service on the third Sunday of Easter. Whether you're watching this at home or together in church with other people on Sunday or later in the week, I hope that what I have to say now will help you and be beneficial to you as you grow in your Christian journey. The disciples had been gathered together in an upper room. They were locked in. Jesus had appeared and spoken to them. And Luke records that he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. That's verse 45 of Luke 24. As a statement, it feels a little bland. Accurate, no doubt. But if we read the same verse and the ones round it from the message, we have a rather fuller and more descriptive account. Let me quote it to you. He went on to open their understanding of the word of God, showing them how to read their Bibles this way. He said, you can see now how it is written that the Messiah suffers, rises from the dead on the third day, and then a total life change through the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed in his name to all nations. Starting from here, from Jerusalem, you are the first to hear and see it. You're the witnesses. What comes next is very important. I am sending what my father promised to you. So stay here in the city until he arrives until you are equipped with power from on high. The same essential message, but padded and so much more exciting as we read it like that. Up until this, up until this point, the disciples, we may infer, had had gaps in their knowledge, or at least in their understanding. You and I, when we're not sure of a total picture, may well, in our inquisitive way, try to fill the gaps. If we're struggling, we may make, may make assumptions. We may develop hypotheses. We may just plain invent things. But we need to have something that fits together as a whole account. When we've done that, we might look back later and sometimes we'll say, we were well wide of the mark. We got that completely wrong. And another time we'll say, hmm, my intuition was good. I got that just about spot on. It's interesting that Jesus had to open their minds to understand the scripture. That implies that they were closed to what was already happening. It's as though they could have known, but they didn't. We may well believe that we have open minds. Some of us may make a great virtue of saying how broad-minded and how receptive to new things and different views we are. But are we really open-minded? Especially when it comes to believing miracles in faith, what is happening in this upper room in Jerusalem is that the Old Testament is starting to drop into place for those disciples. We can look at that as three R's, not reading, writing and arithmetic, but resurrection, redemption and restoration. Resurrection, redemption and restoration. So first, resurrection. Jesus had been talking about his death before it happened. In many of his recorded discussions with the disciples, he'd alluded to it. He'd spoken of rising again, but it seems there was a limited expectation that it was a real promise. Or, if not that, could it be that the disciples so wanted it to happen that they daren't wish for it in case it didn't? Either way, in that room, 
three things then stand out about the mechanical process of resurrection. And they're not insignificant because they make the point that this isn't a normal event. I'm talking to you from the chapel in Framlingham this evening. As I came in downstairs all on my own, I pulled the door behind me with the latch dropped. I'm locked in. But if suddenly someone comes in, I shall assume that it's either someone else with a key or possibly someone's broken in. But I wouldn't expect somebody to just appear. The disciples were behind locked doors. So Jesus' bodily form must have been different. How else did he gain entry? How was it that suddenly he appeared? And then secondly, they saw his hands and his feet. Both had been nailed to the cross, and that made the point. This was the same body which had died, and now it stood before them. And as if that isn't enough, thirdly, they watched as he ate broiled fish. That body, that form that had managed to come into a locked room... That form which was marked with nail wounds in hands and feet could still consume food as ordinary living people round him consumed it. Remarkable, miraculous, extraordinary, frightening, exhilarating. It doesn't really matter which of those adjectives you use. This is something stunning. There's no easy way to brush aside the combination of three pointers to a process, something that's physical and real, and yet which seems beyond belief. And from resurrection, which clearly had happened then, to redemption. If you've used the written form of worship for this morning, you may well have used the call to worship I suggested from the first letter of John chapter 3, where in verse 1 we read the statement, We are the children of God. Entrance into the family of the children of God has a very high bar in terms of required qualifications. Anyone who wants to be part of that family has to be sinless, has to have somehow paid a massive fine to get rid of the sins that have so far weighed down life. And that seems daunting too. Many times we can hear people say those words, I am not worthy. I have done so many things. I am so bad. But the second point that was slowly being realised and still is hard to grasp comes in two parts. The Old Testament teaches us clearly by deduction that all of us are highly sinful however good we may think we are, and sacrifices as prescribed in the laws seemed not to get rid of the marks of those sins as was hoped and believed. Only one sacrifice would work, and it was one that was going to cost a great deal more than money. It was going to be more significant than the life of an animal. It was going to cost a human life. And God the Father had given Jesus Christ the Son to be that sacrificial life. God the Father prepared himself to sacrifice his Son to pay the fines for all of us and to make that very high entry bar into the family of the children of God, one that could be crossed by
by everyone who trusts and ever will trust in what that sacrifice stood for and achieved. That life, the life of Jesus Christ, is the fine needed to discharge the sentences passed against us all and clear the obstacles from the path to full membership of the family of the children of God, whatever we may think about the blackness of what we have done. There are many poetic references in our hymns and songs to the effect of the blood of Jesus washing away our sin. But there's more than just getting rid. There's more than just the resurrection of Jesus. The story isn't complete until we arrive at an understanding of restoration. I well remember from my school days that sometimes when punishment was required, after it had been discharged, the after effects lingered on. In other words, everyone knew about the misdeed, pointed the finger, laughed. Reminders would be meted out for a disproportionate period afterwards. Depending what it was that you'd done, of course, you may have been on some sort of pedestal. More often than not, you were laughed at. In past times, too, a freed prisoner may just as well have been in prison for all the chances there were of reintegration into the world. In other words, when a sentence was over, an individual may well emerge into the world only to be ostracised, shunned, given no chance, and effectively still isolated. Fortunately now, we have a more progressive way of disciplining children than ever I experienced. We're better too at preparing reformed prisoners for life. And after prison, the aim should be the hope of living without stigma, stigma if a character is truly reformed. That's the best way I can illustrate the effects of the complete nature of our redemption through the resurrection. It is a story of complete restoration. Wounds may well still be there for all to see, but they are harmless. The completeness of the healing is the body spiritual behind the flesh, the inner person who is at one with God because of resurrection and redemption. It's extraordinary. The disciples may have needed to have their minds opened to understand that scripture. So I think do I and so probably do you. At the cross, Jesus brought the Old Testament to its conclusion. Everything that had been foretold about a Messiah had been delivered in the shedding of the blood of Jesus. It's unfortunate that we misunderstand what is very basic. Three final points, very short, to take away. Yes, we sin and we deserve death. Jesus died and we live. We more than live, we thrive in God's family because through Jesus we are restored to the state in which we would have been had sin never come into the world. We praise God for that remarkable gift. And let us just pray. God eternal, as we thank you for the gift of resurrection, redemption and restoration, we pray that you working in us in the power of your spirit will help us to have minds opened to understand and to delight and to rejoice 
in what is a gift given freely at great cost <coughs> for us. <clears throat> and now to God be praise, honour and glory, world without end. Amen. <laughs>